Hi, and welcome to Overheard Orlando's 16th installment. Today, I will be sitting down with Stephen Archer, a writer and visual artist, and we're going to be delving into the concept of home, both in the forms of places we've left behind and places we've never been. Stephen will also be reading us an excerpt from one of his untitled works. You don't want to miss this. So, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So, I know that you did the artwork for a previous episode, episode 14, and you are pretty talented at the visual art medium. So, I'm, I just want to know why you chose writing over a more abstract visual format for you to express yourself. Sure. Um I don't know, I've been drawing since I was pretty small and it's always been kind of an outlet. It's it's a hobby for me. The moment it starts becoming too much like work or if I'm kind of forced to do it, if I ever took an art class or something, it, it kind of lost something for me. Um, I prefer to keep it strictly just recreational kind of every so often when it happens. Writing on the other hand, um, I don't know. I just really, I really feel like that's something I could I don't know, that I could be so passionate about that I could kind of make a career out of it and and do it in any context. I don't know. Um, I know that, you know, people say, you know, like a picture's worth a thousand words. And sure, and I, I, I'm i all behind like that kind of sentiment, sentiment but I, I think it's a lot more fun to try to find those words and because a thousand's a lot. But if you can like make a poem out of a few that gives you the same image that a picture would, I think trying to put that together is is a fun challenge. You know, when you finally get someone who's like, you know, when you hear something that just speaks to you so much and you're like, wow, someone put that in words and it's kind of this really amazing phenomenon. I don't know. I like doing that. I can definitely relate to that. I am also myself more of, much more of a words person than visual. I have absolutely no visual eye whatsoever. So it's kind of cool that you can at least function in both mediums, you know, even if uh, writing is more your forte. So who do you write to? Who do you write for? Who Who's it all for? You know, in a couple of classes, they ask you to put together like a, an elevator pitch of like what it is you write and who your intended audience is in just kind of concise. And I, I think what I boiled it down to a while ago was um, writing for the marginalized. So people of color, um, queer people, um, people who may not find that they are represented in a lot of media as is. Um, So writing what I wanted to see growing up, writing uh, about kids um, like me or with like mixed backgrounds or uh, coming from broken homes or people who moved a lot, like that that wasn't common, at least in the stuff that I was picking up and reading. So definitely the stuff I didn't see is the stuff that I try to put out just, you know, in the hope that anyone like me who is missing that kind of content that they can actually see themselves in, um, if I can provide that for at least one person who can see any part of what I'm doing and and see themselves in it, I think that's who I'm writing for. You know, you often hear it said that everything's kind of been done already and it's hard to come up with anything original. But uh, when you put it in that, in those terms, it, it's kind of pretty clear that it hasn't all been done. And there are quite a few stories that are still untold, you know, uh, people of different backgrounds and stuff. And, and uh, it's great to look at a piece of art or read something and be able to relate to it or see yourself in it. So definitely understand the importance of that. Speaking of those, tell us a little bit about your background and where you're, where you come from, kind of what your story is. So I am from Hollywood, Florida, down South. My family before that came from New Jersey. And before even that, they came from Peru. So I was definitely raised predominantly in the Peruvian side of my family. The other side is Haitian. We, I wasn't really exposed to too much Haitian culture growing up. Um, definitely raised with, with the Peruvian side more. Um, so I grew up speaking Spanish first. Uh, I started losing my Spanish once I entered school and growing up eating Peruvian food, hearing Peruvian music, speaking with the Peruvian dialect, which I didn't know was a thing until 
other Spanish speakers are like, oh, you, you must be Peruvian. I didn't even know that was, <laughs> was possible. Um, and certainly that's something that I've carried with me ever since I left home to go to school and that's to be cooking for myself and everything. And it ended up all being Peruvian food for the most part and, and looking into new recipes and things. And as I, as I branched away from home and it became my responsibility to kind of remain close to Peru when I was so far from my family, I, I think I gained a much deeper appreciation for that heritage and having to investigate it myself and kind of if I was ever going to learn anything new about it, it would be something that I had to research. In the last couple of years, I've become so much more attached to this country that I've never even been to. And, you know, I, I, I take the research home and, and my family, there's stuff I, I know now that they've never even heard of. So I, it's become a bit of an obsession. So, yeah, I know that when we had discussed potentially doing this interview that I had kind of, we touched on that a little bit. And I did find that so fascinating that you can draw so much inspiration from a place that you yourself have never even been to. And that is uh, somewhere that you have a connection to, but perhaps you've seen only in videos or photos or in stories told by your parents. What is that like? And and what's it like to draw inspiration from that? I think it's complicated. It's, it's weird and it's rough um, to feel so attached and to feel like you're entitled to so much of that culture because you were raised in it. But then to realize that there's a lot you wouldn't know. There's a lot of self-doubt, I think, you know, when you start to wonder, like, um, you know, the extent to which you might be appropriating your own culture, um, stuff that you weren't as deeply ingrained in as someone would be who was living there now, or who at least like visited family there frequently. Like you, you experience this kind of secondhand removed version of it that is also deeply fulfilling. But then when you turn it around and you want to write about this place or share about this place, and you have to face the reality that you probably don't know it as well as you think, and there's a lot that you miss out on or just simply are unaware of through the nature of having lived here always and never gone back. So there's definitely a complicated dynamic there. Um, you know, advocating for things like when, when you start to share things that you find out about the indigenous populations there or whatever, and you, and, and you, you start to want to talk about them like they are you and they are your background and your people, but really... I'm sure that I'm about as removed from the indigenous populations there as I could be. Um, so it's it's difficult to kind of reconcile that with like the deep, you know, pride that you have for the place that you come from. And then having to also sit back and be like, well, look, that's all fine. But, you know, you you it starts to feel like it's not as yours as you thought it was sometimes. It almost feels to me like Peru is to you something of a birthright, like you are inheriting this culture and this the, these stories and and this past of a of a place even though you've never actually been there it is still yours that's kind of um how i look at it cuz i too have not been to cuba and um i also do like reading a lot about the the rich cultural history and just the different traditions and things that i've learned from my relatives and things who have lived there in the past so tell me some some of the things that you're working on in the writing scope. What are what are you currently writing? Be it for fun, be it professionally, or what or what have you? What are you working on currently? Yeah, uh, I'm currently working on uh, a couple of different projects. Actually, um, I'm taking a course at the moment uh, based on uh, it's creative nonfiction, specifically about locations, um, the the places that you're from and where you live now. Um, and kind of looking introspectively at all the places that mean anything to you. So it's funny that we should be having this conversation because I've been thinking about that pretty deeply lately. So there's those, and those are a lot of fun to really try to unpack, you know, kind of your hometown. I started to think about Hollywood differently after doing an assignment for this class. Um, and I used to think it was a place that I escaped, but now I kind of, I appreciate it a lot more after being forced to really sit and write like, a really nice love letter to this place. Um, so that was cool. Aside from that, I'm also working on a collection of short stories. So it's all short fiction. It's predominantly um, based in queer themes, uh, queer identities, um, also magical realism. So every story has a, some kind of magical element to it. 
um, and usually about people of color. Um, so queer brown magic book is what that's going to be. Um, and then this last ambitious project that's taking a lot out of me is I'm trying to write a fantasy novel. Uh, I've been brainstorming that for a while, and it also draws heavily on Andean cultures. Um, I wanted to see if I could, you know, bring a little bit of kind of Peru adjacent um, representation into the fantasy world, which is largely white right now, and it has been for a long time. Um, I feel like Peru is one place that gets a bad rap, uh, you know, through like Indiana Jones or whatever, and you kind of imagine it as just jungles and cannibals or something, and it, it it's <laughs> definitely not. Um, so I don't know, setting a, a fantasy there seemed like a really fun project. Um, so it's involved a lot of research. That's definitely something that's contributed to my burgeoning love of the place. Um, but yeah, hoping that works out in the near future, at least have a, a rough draft to work with. You know, I kind of wanted to go back really quick because I thought it was interesting how you said that Hollywood, Florida was a place that you escaped. And now it kind of almost feels like it's a place that you can escape to. So I, I kind of thought that it's kind of nice that you were able to turn what at least at one point in your life you thought was a negative chapter or negative point into, you know, something nostalgic maybe, or something that you can at least look at, look back on with uh, a level of appreciation, even if you're glad to be gone, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. The It used to be a place where, you know, as, as someone who's you know, come out since leaving home, um, the place where you couldn't have been yourself. And, you know, you kind of find yourself when you move to a place like Orlando. Um, and having been here for as long as I have, I, I definitely feel like it was a move that I needed. But going home, that's that's where my family is. That's where they've lived for a long time. Um, and I think I counted recently, I've moved something like 15 or 16 times in my life. Um, the last few were, you know, different school apartments, but before that I moved 11 times with my family. So we were all over the place, but that one house where my grandma lives in Hollywood is kind of home base. It's where we always end up coming back to. It's, it's where we gather now. Um, and that neighborhood going to school down the street from my grandma's house and everything, it really is, that's like the one stable place ever. So as, as that kind of you know, hub of stability, it, a place to come back to whenever you're somewhere else. It's, it's definitely, it's come to mean a lot in that regard. What would you say to somebody who may write either as a hobby or something they want to do professionally, who doesn't see themselves in these things and maybe doesn't feel so confident that their story is going to be of any interest to someone else? What would you say to that person? I tell them, uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but every story is worth telling. One of the conversations that I have pretty often is in defense of creative nonfiction. Um, and people wonder, you know, why, why, why is that a genre? Why does anyone write that um, when you could be writing fiction or poetry or whatever? Um, and they kind of lose um, kind of the impact that just telling your own story can have, even if it's just for you. Um, if you find something else, uh, find something out about yourself through writing about yourself, then it's worth it. And if through your writing about yourself, someone else can discover something about themselves, that's worth it too. And every person you touch who's got, you know, their own unique experiences, who can see even a little bit of themselves in yours, I'd say that's, that's everything. I, that makes it worth it. Even if no one reads it, even if you kind of disregard your own writing as like, oh, it's just my diary, who would want this? Um, I guarantee that there's one person out there that can benefit from hearing what you have to say. And sometimes that one person is yourself. And you have to realize that that is enough sometimes. You know, that kind of parallels a little bit with how I've been feeling about this podcast. So I can definitely understand because there are times where, you know, you get the imposter syndrome and you're like, who who wants to hear what I have to say? Who really cares? You know, like, who am I to think that I could put something out there into the world that anyone would really even be interested in? So very familiar feelings there. I totally understand that. And I think that that's something that most people can relate to at one point in their life or another. So just out of curiosity, is there anything that you'd be willing to read for us here? A little excerpt or something from one of your past works or something you're currently working on? Sure. Uh, 
I have here an excerpt from a piece about my hometown in Hollywood, um, specifically the neighborhood I grew up in called Driftwood. Uh, it's this tiny patch. Um, everything there is, you know, there's there's a couple of schools, a graveyard, and an old folks' home. That's about all we have. Um, and so this comes from a piece that focuses on kind of just a lot of details about that place that I took for granted before. Um, yeah, so here's an excerpt. It doesn't really have a title yet, but here we go. Okay. I visit Hollywood less frequently with every passing year, and each return is like a new slide in a Viewmaster. I'm never sure what the city will look like when I come back to it, but I do know that in Driftwood the lawns are studded with tiny pink weeds that stain your fingers if you squeeze their petals. I know that nights at my grandma's mean sweating into her microfiber sofas. I know that new middle schoolers will share headphones in view of the same graves at Fred Hunter's memorial gardens as they walk home, and that the tallest headstone there belongs to a man called Studnik. On the other side of Sheridan Street, I know the floors at Flipper Cinema are sticky as flypaper, but their cookies are fresh. I know the owner of the laundromat next door likes to ask if I have a novia and that I'll never come out to her. I know I've never seen the psychic open for business. I know the skaters practice tricks on the wheelchair ramp outside the Goodwill and eat pub subs on the curb. I know there are just as many ancestral homes on our streets as there are revolving doors, and that I'll always hear about new neighbors a couple of times a year. I know old families will sit on old porches, and that at night we'll all look up at the new beam of light shooting up from the neck of the guitar, miles away. I know that the green sign three doors down from my grandma's house now reads Freedom Street. Driftwood remains reliably there, all parakeets and rivered streets, a gray cast-off bobbing in the restless change of a city desperate to finally become the other Hollywood. She's not much, but nobody minds. I've seen enough movies to know how Driftwood comes in handy in a flood. Wow, I really enjoyed that. Actually, really, um, while you were reading that, I really was thinking about how you, the very first question I asked you about visual art versus that and that piece really created quite a visual. I felt like I had been there before. I felt like it felt familiar, but it also felt like you were bringing me to a new place. So that was that was really nice. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you very much. So um, last question here. I always ask this one. Tell us a little bit about your personal philosophy or your overarching life view just in general. What, what gets you by? I think more and more um, recently, what my personal philosophy has sort of evolved into is trying to normalize doing things for yourself um, and being unafraid to prioritize your own happiness and well-being and expression, um, whether that's in the form of, you know, or or whether it's confrontation or, or something that you just want to do for yourself. Um, I know that personally I was drawing for others for a long time and then I kind of went through something that made me kind of readjust and I started drawing like only self portraits for like six months just so I could feel what it was like to create art for nobody else but myself. Um, and then this, this goes back to, you know, the writing situation, even if it's not for anyone to see, if you write something that, you know, you or you think is cool, but you don't think anyone else will think it is. Well, if you are that one person, well, that's great. Um, doing things for you and not because anyone else can gain from it or you can get anything out of it, um, you know, monetizing your hobbies or whatever, like that's all fun and good, but, um, sometimes it's just nice to treat yourself and, and treat yourself well and, and do things just because you want to do them because you want to see it happen. I like that a whole lot. Treat yourself well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I've had a blast. Well, that was a rather thought-provoking interview, I think that the concept of home is really interesting because most of us at one point in our life or another have trouble with the concept of home, whether we're searching for it or running away from it. Check me out on Instagram at Overheard Orlando Podcast, or check out the newly launched website at overheardorlando.com. And of course, you can reach me at overheardorlandopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening and stay true.